Thank you, David, and to your, your choir and your musicians. That's a beautiful, beautiful anthem of uh, Philippians chapter 2. What a great reminder. And Steve, thank you for that reminder that this is Bright Week. I have to confess, I just learned of that term this past week, Bright Week, the week after Easter. And indeed it is so because it's so uh, 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 bright to be together here uh, in this post-Easter celebration. I hope that you find yourself at a good place and a good space here at this very church. Yesterday afternoon, I was attending a birthday party uh, of a 100-year-old, a person that uh, close to our family that we have loved down through the decades, and so she was surrounded by family and friends. She continues to be a very bright spot in wit and humor, so I have goals now after yesterday. But when the question was asked, what is your secret to longevity? People love to ask uh, cent centenarians that. What is your secret to longevity? I thought her answer was appropriate. She just surrounds herself with pleasant people in her life. And I think about that too as it applies to each of us. Not that we're always pleasant or everyone we encounter is pleasant, but there's something really important about being together, not just on Easter but on the Sundays and other times that we can gather as God's community of faith, I do believe it really does give us life. Now let's hear together the life-giving words found in our gospel lesson, chapter 20 of John, beginning with verse 19. Contextually, I want to remind you that in this passage of Scripture, it is still Easter, the first day of the week. Hear with me the gospel reading. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the uh, on the mark of nails in my hand and in his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Let us give thanks for the reading and hearing of this as Holy Scripture. Let us pray. Opening the doors of your house, O oh Lord, and opening our lives to this worship together, now we pray you open our minds and our hearts and our very selves, that you may continue to pour into us what you and you alone have to say. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let me begin with a disclaimer that there is no way I can cover the territory that needs to be covered in this gospel reading I'm not even going to talk about Thomas, not because it's not important. I actually love that part of the gospel lesson. I love Thomas. He's my disciple for many good reasons, and maybe I'll preach on this at, a, at another time. But really what I want to focus on is the first part of our gospel reading this morning, 
because to me it leads into the title of the message, When the Bunny Has Left the Building. Now, I don't know if you've gone after, Chris, uh, after Easter shopping, but go in any grocery store, and I dare you to find a rabbit. Maybe you might find one in an obscure aisle. I know that I scored a bunch of Reese's chocolate-covered uh, peanut butter eggs that I was really delighted to, but there was no bunny at the Kroger where I shop. But the bunny has left the building in other ways, too. While consumers are still looking for something new to consume, we, the faith community, we still have a story to tell. We have a life to live. Today we listen to the gospel of John telling the story and he reminds us, he reminds us that it's still Easter. In fact, a little bit of history here. The reason we Christians gather on Sunday, the first day of the week, instead of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, which is the Sabbath according to Jewish custom. The reason Christians gather on Sunday is because that's the day the Lord was resurrected. Every Sunday is Easter Sunday. So we gather here. The bunny has left the building, but there's still a story to tell. But when we read of this gospel lesson there's something curious happening on that first Easter. The triumphant church of God finds itself behind locked doors. The triumphant church is in reality the fearful church, and the doors are locked. Do any of y'all remember a time when churches used to keep the doors unlocked? Some of you remember that? And, and even if, even if you, the doors were locked, you knew where to find the key. I pastored a little church just north of Rome, Georgia, my first pastorate, as a matter of fact, and yet they kept their doors locked because, you know, you never know, but everybody knew to look underneath the wooden steps as a rusty nail hanging the key, and you could get into the church anytime you wanted to. But let me tell you something, unless you think I'm advocating, keep the doors wide open all the time, I have not once but twice had people come into my office during Sunday morning worship service, and still one Sunday it was a pocketbook uh, at another church. It was my cell phone, and, and even then I had to learn, well, maybe I need to lock my office door alongside all the other doors. We know a thing or two about locking doors and keeping people out. Here in this story, the disciples are hiding behind locked doors Though they saw firsthand the, the resurrected power of God, they now found themselves in fear and in hiding. Fear and hiding. The Easter church was the fearful church. The fearful church comes when events confuse and tragedy strikes. The fearful church is the church when things are going on that has no explanation, no understanding, and when we no longer have imagination to see or do anything else other than to hunker down and lock the doors. And by the way, I, I think every church has its experience of being the fearful church there are culture wars, identity politics, national elections that sometimes leave the empowered church looking more like the fearful church with tribes within scurrying around from one anxious argument to another. And if we're not careful, interims can look a little bit like that too, where we find ourselves being less and less the empowered church and more and more the fearful church. So the disciples, they shut the doors. They, they lock and keep others outside. Rumors were outrageous and fearful politics had seeped inside and Jesus gate crashes into their midst. <laughs> By the way, I was planning to say that. And just this past week, and I don't know if you've been watching the local news or not or reading, just this past week on Mercer's campus, at the corner, we host the southeast headquarters of the FBI. It's actually on Mercer's property, leased to the FBI, and someone tried to crash into the FBI. Uh, 
literally, I'm leaving for lunch, and I see a, a car that had obviously just crashed into the gates, and I'm sort of thinking, well, they took a wrong turn. It happens, right? I drive back from lunch, and there's an armored vehicle on each side of said car. I'm thinking, why would you crash into the FBI? I mean, there are people there that know what they're doing, and they did know what they're doing. Gate crashing is not all that it's cracked up to be, but Jesus knows a thing or two about gate crashing and finds himself in spite of the locked doors, in spite of the fearful church, in spite of the hesitant people of God coming in their midst. And when Jesus enters a meeting, Jesus takes over. And he says four things to this church, this fearful church. For you linear thinkers, you will be relieved. You know where I'm going if you follow along. He says first to the fearful church, peace. He doesn't say it just once, but he says it three times. Peace. Peace be with you. Peace. Now, in the Jewish community, peace is a common greeting. Shalom in the Hebrew. To date, it is still used among our Jewish friends and greeting one another. It's a way of saying, hey, how y'all doing? Everything all right? How's your mom and them? I mean, it's encapsulated with a very tender form of greeting. In fact, if you've ever had the chance to travel to Jerusalem, you from the south, all of us from the south, you can go and buy a tile in Jerusalem that says, shalom, y'all. It's just this nice connection here, that you're welcome, you belong, but it's more than just a, a simple form of greeting. This powerful word on the, uh, on the lips of Jesus redefines everything. When, when Jesus speaks the word, he puts to flight all of the unpeace-like things in our life, war and hostility and fear and anxiety and loneliness. They don't count anymore. Jesus enters the room and he reminds the fearful disciples that though those things used to define your identity, they, they, they don't have jurisdiction anymore. And as proof, he says, hey, you get wounded along the way. I'm going to show you my scars. I'm going to show you my battle injuries. And I'm still going to say to you, peace, shalom. God has heard you. Perhaps we need to reflect on these words of Jesus a little bit when we think about how our own words and actions may betray the very peace that God desires for each of us. And anger and hate and bigotries and anxieties, they have no place for the Easter church, no part of the empowered church. Peace be with you. Peace be with y'all. Peace, y'all. Peace. No, don't take my word for it. That comes from Jesus. The second thing that Jesus says to the fearful church who wants to be the empowered church is, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. The word is, is mission. The Easter church is not just a meeting where everybody is showing up, but it's also one of mission. It's the movement from a quaint social gathering to one that is swirling with enterprise and action. The, the problem with the fearful church is that it doesn't think that it's sent. Instead, it can be tempting to say, let's just stay put. And we may add, because it's so lovely here. Every place I've ever lived, including my home uh, where I grew up, the saying was something along the lines, you don't need to go anywhere else. This is God's country. I heard it when I grew up in Putnam County, Georgia. I heard it when I moved away to college in Rome, Georgia. This is God's country. When I spent a summer in the Philippine Islands, the locals would say, this is the most beautiful place on earth. And on the story goes, and I got to say, living in Roswell for these eight years, I got to agree, we kind of like it here. We don't want to go anywhere else. Churches can be like that, you know. Why go when you got everything you need here, walking around these beautiful facilities. It's very tempting to just realize that, hey, this is a wonderful place to be, to stay put. But sometimes we forget 
that it's not about staying put. In fact, it has nothing to do with staying put. There's a Latin phrase called missio dei, the mission of God, the work of God. And, and when you realize that you're part of the work of God, it is a connection with the, another Latin phrase, the imago dei. We're created in the image of God. So the work of God is about the people of God joining God at work beyond ourselves. Think of it this way. And it, at some point, all analogies break down, so forgive the uh, simplicity that may sound a little simplistic. But think about it like, a, well, like an airport. I love to go to airports, believe it or not, even though it's a kind of a headache. There's something exciting about an airport. When I go to Hartsville-Jackson Airport, I mean, you go there and there's food all over the world that is being served. There are people all over the world in, 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 in uh, high, high strong energy. Uh, and, and everybody's going someplace. And it's just, it's exciting to be in an airport. Now just imagine how silly it would be if I go to an airport, walk around, enjoy some overpriced coffee, and, and people watch for a couple of hours, and then get in my car and pay a, an overpriced bill for the parking, by the way, and just go home. You'd think that's the most silly and ridiculous thing ever. Because the airport is not the point. The airport is to help you get where you need to be going and to get you back home again. Church is a bit like that. It's not about we are the destination. Just show up here. We'll receive your membership certificate, and we'll have nice food to serve you on Wednesday night and, and a wonderful gathering on Sunday morning, and you don't need to worry about anything. We'll just see you again next week. It's ridiculous. No, we gather here because we, the people of God, the Imago Dei, the image bearers of God, are also called to go and join the Missio Dei, the work of God, into a waiting world. I'm so excited about what the church is going to be about doing in just a few weeks. And I was really counting on joining with y'all on that Saturday, but it happens to be the birthday weekend of a grandson that I have. And I'm sorry, but y'all are a distant second place on this one here. But I do hope that beyond the projects, it's a reminder that it really isn't about the gathering, but the being sent. Jesus reminds the fearful church that you are an empowered church because you are sent people to go and do and love and be. The third thing that Jesus says to the fearful church is to receive the Holy Spirit. He breathes on them and it recalls a time in which God and the creative energy of Genesis breathes life into the nostrils of man and man takes on life and form and becomes the image bearer. Jesus breathes on them this Holy Spirit that is intruding and invading and energizing this power of God that empowers us to live a life beyond ourselves. This Holy Spirit causes us to do the things that we did not think we could do, to, to imagine thoughts that we did not think we could dream to take chances that we would ordinarily not take the church is never going to go anywhere on its own steam and first baptist roswell please hear this because i have pastored long enough through the years to have heard more than one conversation yeah preacher but we just don't have the budget for that and i'm a big fan of budgets or yeah preacher but we just don't have the talent pool there that kind of feels personal yell, preacher, but we just don't have enough volunteers. It's always what we don't have enough of or what we can't imagine or what we can dream. Do you dare think that when Jesus enters the building and takes over a meeting and he reminds the people there gathered that there is peace among you, that there is work to do for you, that indeed through the Holy Spirit, the world is the opportunity waiting. And so it is for this church. That God's Spirit breathes here over us and within us and beyond us. That the people of First Baptist Roswell are empowered not by budgets, not by personnel, not by clergy, not even by our own talent pool and gifts, which are many in this church. But that God's Spirit dwells with us. And with that, we are empowered to do what God has called us to do. The fourth thing that Jesus shares with the fearful church desiring to become the empowered church is that is if you forgive the sins of any, 
they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of others, they are retained. It's not enough that we talk about peace and we talk about mission and we talk about power. It's a reminder that our one primary work is to forgive one another. Now, there are other places in the gospel that Jesus tells us this, but this takes on kind of a heightened power to it. If you forgive, if you release, you're letting go of something and they're gone. But if you choose to hang on to it, it will stay with you like mud. The church of Easter is given fresh work to do. It's to move in and break those vicious cycles cycles that generate death and death and death unless there is forgiveness the cycle goes round and round it creates despair it creates abuse uh, families play the games of not forgiving one generation to the next and always ending in some form of abuse and hostility to not forgive kills both the victim and the perpetrator God has created us uh, uh, in, 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 uh, a, a people in this place whose main business Business is the forgiveness of sin, the cancellation of death, the breaking of the cycle of debt. In the last few weeks, ironically, I've been interacting with people who are in the midst of death or, and, and or dying, and I get reminded about, about how encumbered we can be so late in life. Families not speaking to one another and how that contributes to so much unnecessary pain upon pain. Just today in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, there's an article about unclaimed remains in Macon. It's in many, many respects not so unique. Ask any funeral home that has a crematorium, and there's going to be hundreds, more than likely, of boxes of unclaimed cremains. But in this particular article, the, uh, the Sheriff's Department had just simply commented, yeah, We've got remains here where we know who the families, but they don't want them. They haven't spoken to their sibling in decades. Or there's a family squabble going on and, and they can't agree about who's to be the recipient. Even in death, the failure to forgive is a pain passed down from one generation to the next. Maybe you're sitting here and you know some of that pain firsthand. Jesus' words continue to, I think, speak true to us. Jesus becomes that gate crasher that will not allow the fearful church to remain behind locked doors. So it's true. It's true. The bunny has left the building. And so should we. So let us receive the peace let us receive the mission. Let us receive the power. And let us receive the forgiveness. Moving from the fearful church to the empowered church. The world is waiting. Let us pray. Oh God, we sing of being your Easter people as we move from bright week now to the waiting weeks. As Easter people, O oh God, like the gathered disciples before, we are waiting and we are going and we are living and breathing your resurrection in our lives. Now guide us, we pray, behind these doors to the doors that soon will open up in the coming days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for our invitation, I want to invite your response this morning. You've kind of grown accustomed to some of my ways uh, and my peculiarities. I want to invite you to decide this morning how you're going to respond. Now, anybody can walk down an aisle. The aisle's open. We'll pray with you. We'll stand alongside you. However, you might need to come down that aisle. If that's something you need to do, great. To join with this church, you profess your faith that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Again, the aisle is open. But response may be something else. Maybe you've come here and you've not felt the peace of Christ in your life. And I get that. Life and this world has a way of working that over. 
Maybe your response is to simply seek the shalom that God freely has to offer in your life. And perhaps this church can help cult- enculturate peace in you. Or maybe you're one of those that has enjoyed church as kind of a hot tub religion. You've come here and it feels good and comfortable and you don't need to go anywhere else. But you've recognized that no, this is more than a destination. It's something beginning. And you feel the nudgings of the Lord leading you to go do something in Jesus' name. Maybe you've recognized that you've been trying too hard on your own strength. And let me tell you, friend, no one can keep up on their own strength. You just cannot do it. And today is a day in which your response is to receive what Christ so freely offers, the Holy Spirit to inspire, guide, and send you forth. Finally, and maybe it is most importantly, Maybe the words of Jesus inviting you to forgive has hit something very resonant in your life. You can hang on to it, but brothers and sisters, that's a heavy weight to hang on to, and ultimately, you just can't hold it all. So perhaps forgiveness is where God is leading you this morning. However, the Lord is working in your life and in our life, I want to invite you as we sing together our hymn of invitation. Let's stand together and sing together and respond as God so leads you.